Join the housing experts behind the RPS Moody's Analytics House Price Index forecasts as they discuss emerging risks and opportunities in the Canadian housing market, including highly localized findings from our neighborhood, city, and town level forecasts. We're excited to announce that we have expanded the forecasts beyond the national, provincial, and metro levels to now include all cities, towns, and neighborhoods across Canada. I'm proud to say we have the most extensive forecasts available commercially, together with the most extensive historical house price index. And now to present the September house price forecast, let's hear from the team who put it together. Coming up, you'll hear insights from Brendan Lacerda and Abhilasha Singh from Moody's Analytics and Brian Choa from RPS. The, the relationship between house prices and unemployment has been temporarily severed. Um, I'll also add, though, that it's, it's completely rational. That, that the movements we're seeing make sense when we consider some more of the you know, other key indicators for the housing market. Um, I think, you know, in that regard, the key facts are um, disposable, in, you know, even though labor income fell in the second quarter, disposable income is way up. The second key thing to remember is that with everything the Bank of Canada has done, mortgage rates are way down to historic lows. Um, the third element of you know, why house prices haven't fallen is because of the mortgage deferrals. Because of the deferrals, there's no immediate rush to deleverage, and, and you don't get a you know, fire sale of homes that would push down prices. And then, you know, sort of we can we can try to take account of all those factors with our model, but the fourth factor, which I, th- I think is sort of really one of the trickiest to deal with, is the issue of preferences. Or, or sometimes in macroeconomics, what we would call preference shocks, which sort of without getting you know, too academic or too technical, you know, the, the idea is that you know, macro is, you know, ma- macroeconomics has micro foundations. That if you add up everyone's individual behavior, you get the sum or, or the macro or the aggregate. So, so when we think about consumers' choices, you know, as far as you know, when to buy a home, you know, what home to buy, their decision is a function of their preferences and their budget. So normally when we think about a recession, you know, we think about changes in budget, you know, changes in people's income. But the extra layer of complexity with the COVID-19 crisis is the potential for preferences to change. So you know, there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, are, are people you know, moving out of the cities and moving into more suburban areas? Um, what we sort of can tease out from the data and see is that you know, there, there is a preference for larger homes, you know, maybe adding that home office or you know, getting a single family home with a backyard, that, that there has been a shift in preferences towards that type of dwelling. So I'll, I'll, I'll temporarily pause there. And um, Joel, if you could flip to the next slide. So sort of taking a step back for a moment and you know, raising that topic again that I, I posed at the beginning of the presentation, this eye of the storm, you know, which direction is the economy headed? And one of the, you know, one of the key things that you know, raises some concern is the increasing number of new cases of uh, COVID-19. So there was the big wave earlier in the year that peaked around you know, late April, early May. Um, but you know, with, 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 the clo- with the lockdown, you know, the, the rates of new cases, you know, bottomed out around the beginning of July. So I, I should point out, because um, the X axis on this slide got, uh, the formatting got a little messed up, um, but those numbers correspond to the month of the year. So, so three is March. Um, and actually I should say that, you know, this slide is actually a little out of date because we get new figures every day, um, but the seven day moving average has pushed above 1,000. Um, so it's you know more than halfway to its previous peak. Um, I'll add right now that our our baseline assumption in our forecast is that you know authorities are able to contain the spread, that this number goes lower over the the rest of the year, and that there's not a significant second wave of infections that require the economy to re shut down again. Um, I think it's, you know, what, what we do is, you know, at Moody's is we produce alternative scenarios where we you know, impose different assumptions 
you know, some more optimistic, some more pessimistic um, on this. So we, we produce these alternative scenarios. So we do have forecasts that, you know, assume, you know, what if there is a, a massive second wave of infections? Um, but right now with the baseline, we're operating under the assumption that there is not a second wave that is so significant that it requires the economy to shut down again. Because that would mean another round of layoffs, GDP contracts, you know, in essence, a second shutdown would mean a second recession. Um, that would certainly seem unavoidable. Uh, Joel, if you could jump to the next slide. And, you know, one other thing I want to mention is, you know, with, you know, how novel this crisis is, you know, something we you know hadn't really thought too much about before. Um, we've also realized that sort of a novel crisis requires us to look at novel indicators. Um, so, you know, some of the things we're tracking closely are things like Google mobility data. Um, so, you know, all our, our, our phones track our movements and, you know, in a lot of ways that's a bad thing, uh, but in one way it's helpful is it provides information about people's um, economic activity and travel activity. Um, so this is from Google mobility. It, it counts the number of visits people are making to different types of locations. Um, you know, whether it's like retail or pharmacies or um, I, I even they include visits to like public parks, which, which I didn't include here in this slide. The main takeaway, you know, what you want to see, because I think this sort of speaks to the shape of the business cycle, is we had this massive drop off in you know, the beginning of the second quarter in April. And then, you know, we had this rebound, but the recovery has stalled. And, you know, one other fact that makes, you know, this picture kind of troubling is, um, you know, between the decline and the recovery, you know, the, the measure lost about, you know, from peak to trough, it fell about, you know, by about a, um, you know, by about a third. Um, but the key thing is of, of the ground it's recovered so far, it's recovered about two thirds of the lost ground um, before leveling off. And, you know, of concern is also that the labor market has recovered about two thirds of the jobs lost. But you know, this high frequency data would suggest that you know, the number of job gains going forward is gonna slow down. Uh, Joel, if you could flip to the next slide. Um, you know, so you, know, you saw the same picture sort of in the uh, mobility data, but you know, the key thing here is that GDP fell off a cliff in the second quarter. And you know, merely describing it as the longest or the, the largest loss on record, I don't think actually does it justice because if we think back to the last recession in 2009, when the economy contracted, by the time it was done contracting, it had erased about two and a half years of GDP growth. This latest decline in GDP would effectively eliminate eight years of GDP growth. So just in terms of scale, it, it's absolutely massive. Now, of course, the comparison isn't apples to apples because a lot of this drop in GDP was caused by you know, public health measures. So the reopening will return a lot of this. Um, but you know, as we'll sort of see going ahead, the recovery is not going to be immediate, that there is uh, a bit of a slow patch uh, before we you know, really start getting back to um, previous highs. So the question is, you know, how could GDP drop so much and the housing market be completely unaffected? So Joel, if you jump to the next slide. Now this might seem, you know, like there's not much going on here, but this actually might be one of the most important slides in the presentation. Um, because what it does is it shows what's happening with incomes. So as I mentioned before, you know, the four key reasons house prices haven't fallen is you know, incomes, mortgage rates, deferrals, and changes in preferences. So what we see happen in the second quarter is even though the green line, you know, wages and salaries of employees fell, you know, about 9%, disposable income actually soared 10%. This is because all the checks that are going out to households. So if you combine the drop in consumption with the increase in income, you get this massive increase in savings rate. So Canadian households have a lot of, you know, buying power at their disposal at the moment. And Joel, if you jump to the next slide. So not only do we have an intervention on the fiscal side, we also have this massive intervention on the monetary policy side with the Bank of Canada massively increasing the size of its balance sheet. 
So they went from about $120 billion in assets on their balance sheet to now $550 billion. So this is really something unprecedented. They, they did not do this to this extent um, during the last recession. And if you look at the composition of this central bank intervention, if you see with the orange line, the securities purchased for resale agreements, that's interventions in the repo market, which really helps out mortgage financing because that's where a lot of you know, monoline mortgage lenders are getting you know, liquidity and credit. What we also see in this picture, though, is that the Bank of Canada is also buying a lot of government bonds, which is the government's issuing a lot of debt at the moment. And essentially, to some degree, the Bank of Canada is monetizing that debt. Joel, if you could jump to the next slide. So when we think about the path forward for interest rates, we have to keep two things in mind. One thing is the quantitative easing program going on. And the second part is the Bank of Canada you know, changing its target for the overnight rate, you know, it, its policy rate. So these two key, thinking about how these two key events are going to unfold over the forecast, we expect that the quantitative easing and the increasing of the bank's balance sheet, that comes to a halt in you know, sort of mid-2021 or like in the second quarter of 2021. That's why we expect to see mortgage rates and sort of some other long-term yields start to rise in mid-2021. But it's actually not until 2023 that the Bank of Canada begins raising its target for the overnight rate. And when that happens, that you know, keeps pushing rates up higher after that point. Um, even though you know, we have rates increasing, it's the, the pace of the increases are fairly slow. You can see how quickly they recover uh, previous levels from previous years. Uh, Joel, if you want to jump to the next slide. Um, so I mentioned before this, this key idea of the shape of the recovery. Um, and, and I do want to apologize in this slide because I, I did um, the, the left axis isn't formatted correctly. I've actually um, indexed GDP to 100 in 2019. Um, so that would be its last peak. Um, so reading the left axis, you can read off you know, the peak to trough magnitudes of the decline. Um, but what I want to talk about sort of is this phase of the recovery. So we've already been through the recession. That's where you know, GDP contracted significantly. Um, that was the first and the second quarter. But we're almost through the reopening phase. And this is the phase where you know, businesses are opening their doors again, restrictions are relaxing. So you get this massive rebound or spike in activity. But the problem lies over the quarters ahead where we expect a pause or a slowdown. And the reason for that is that you know, the fiscal stimulus measures are going to start to wear off. Um, unemployment is still significantly elevated. The continued number and the rising number of COVID-19 cases means that the confidence is still going to remain depressed. Um, businesses aren't going to be able to operate at quite the capacity they were at before. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, elements lining up against GDP growth in 20, late 2020, early 2021. Um, one of the other things I'll add, too, is that we can get data from Statistics Canada on the breakdown of temporary layoffs versus permanent layoffs. And the recovery so far in jobs has really been concentrated in for workers whose layoffs were temporary. What we see is that the number of permanent layoffs is still significantly elevated. Um, it's about at levels, you know, highs from the last recession. So. You can see in here, you know, we expect unemployment is going to remain stubbornly high um, through most of 2021. And then it's our assumption that, you know, in the second half of 2021, a vaccine's developed. Um, that also, you know, leads to an increase in confidence um, and a more robust recovery takes hold. Um, so, Joel, if you could flip to the next slide. So, you know, putting all these factors together, we get our baseline forecast. Um, and what the baseline forecast shows is that we expect house prices to fall about 7% over the next year um, before bottoming out and recovering. Um, I, I, I don't want to get too hung up on the exact you know, magnitude of the decline. And you know, I, I, we can have a debate about you know, exactly what that means or you know, how we expect, you know, what, what leads to that expectation. Um, 
But what we're saying here is that when the stimulus measures are exhausted and house prices have to obey the fundamentals of the labor market, that our model would predict that house prices will fall. This depends on a lot of assumptions, though. So, you know, if we think that, you know, the you know, government of Canada is going to you know, bring significantly more stimulus into the market, uh, that could you know, lead to one of our more upside scenarios where we don't expect um, house prices to fall. Um, alternatively, you know, if we have one of those significant second wave of infections, um, then we do risk one of the downside scenarios where we have a very steep drop in home prices. So to cover this in more detail and, and really dig into our house price forecasts, um, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Abulasha, um, who uh, she builds our house price models. She does all the forecasting for our, our subnational areas and, you know, detailed by different property type. Um, and as Joel said, you know, we even have forecasts and scenarios uh, down to the zip code level now. Um, so really an incredible level of detail. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Abulasha. Thank you for setting the stage for the housing uh, dynamics. Uh, so Canada's housing market is riding high right now, as we all know, despite all the weakness in the labor market. But to say that the housing market has navigated the pandemic unsafe would be a little misleading. Let's begin by looking at uh, some of the basic housing market indicators at the national and subnational level, starting with the resale market. Um, Joel, if you could uh, skip to the next slide. For me. Thank you. So Canada's resale market started to recover in early 2019 from the several policy-induced slowdowns. By February of 2020, sales that's uh, on the left side of the axis in this chart uh, was up by almost 25% on a year to ago basis and was set to have a bumper, another bumper year uh, this year. However, the sales slowed in March as lockdowns and social distancing measures were put in place by the government. April was the worst month for the housing market with sales and new listings dropping to the lowest level as buyers and sellers stayed away from the market to prevent the spread of the virus. What happened though uh, in the aftermath of that was home sales and listings came roaring back in summer. And uh, there's several reasons for it and Ben mentioned a few of them. For example, the first one being uh, the government stimulus measures uh, have caused the disposable incomes to soar and buyers who still had their jobs realized that the world is not falling apart for them. They are still getting paid. And the interest, the low interest rate was a plus for them. Third, uh, the pandemic has uh, shifted the consumer preferences in response to the new normal, leading to a spike in demand for more spacious homes. Although we do not have uh, a lot of data in that, but we are seeing uh, a few indications that uh, people are looking for more spacious homes. Um, and the last reason being sellers now, unlike during the pandemic, are able to show their homes online as the home selling industry quickly adapted to the changing conditions. And with that, existing home sales rose to 672,000 analyzed units in August. It is one of the highest level on record. And on a year-to-date basis, sales are now just a touch below, uh, sorry, touch above the previous year levels, suggesting that the pent up demand is largely unleashed. And uh, the demand and supply conditions is extremely tight in Canada. The number of months of inventory, and uh, that's on the left side of, sorry, the right side of the axis in the chart, uh, fell from 5.3 months uh, in early 2019 to about 4.2 months in early 2020, and now it's down to 2.6 months, which is an extremely tight uh, mar market. But uh, not all markets are equal. Uh, Toronto is a clear standout. Recent sales uh, that we see in, um, from the data is mostly driven by 
Toronto and the surrounding regions, and also from Vancouver. And within the Toronto region, the sales fair driven by low-rise homes, supporting the idea that people are now looking for more spacious homes. With strong sales in the last few months, Toronto is left with just a few months, not few months, a few weeks of uh, inventory. While on the other hand, Calgary has more than four months of investment, inventory. Although it's still tight, but low inventories in Calgary is not because of increasing sales, but it is because of lack of listings. Julia, if you could move to the next slide. So what was the effect on uh, the house prices uh, and how different markets behaved in the recent months? So this chart here is for transaction-weighted composite home price index, uh, which is tracked by RPS, and it is scaled by two, uh, 2015. So if you look at the 13 Metro Composite National Index, you see that home prices were almost flat from uh, early 2017 until almost early 2019. House prices slowly started to rise in mid-2019 and have continued to march ahead, despite Canada facing one of the worst economic crises which uh, Brendan earlier mentioned that we are seeing a disconnect between the home prices and the economic conditions. This chart also shows the growing divergence among the major market. Toronto and Vancouver are one of the most active and expensive markets in Canada, and house prices in both the metro areas turned around last year and have trended up since then, as stock markets in both these regions have supported the price gains. House prices in Toronto were up by almost 8.5% and in Vancouver by almost 10.5% on a year to ago basis. Ottawa, on the other hand, is up by, uh, is, is up and it is not as up by almost 12% and it's not an expensive market as Toronto or Vancouver, but it has one of the hottest housing market in Canada. On the other hand, if you look at Edmonton and Calgary, they are not only below their 2015 levels; they're also below their um, they are also below their last year levels. So they are they are on the other end of the housing market, performing uh, having the worst performance. Uh, Joel, if you could turn to the next slide, please. So if we now turn to the new home market, let's see what's going on with the housing starts. And this is data from Canada Mortgage Housing Corporation. And the story with the housing stars is very similar to that of uh, sales of existing homes. Housing starts declined when social restrictions were put in place. And as the restrictions got relaxed, housing starts bounced back. However, we are seeing uh, that the performance of home building is bifurc bifurcating. While the multifamily side has quickly rebounded and they are well above their peak prices levels, single family starts still remain in a slump. And it is not surprising to see that multifamily uh, homes have recovered so fast as projects that were planned before the prices are still continuing, given the development and planning cost. Builders have put in too much money into the projects already and to abandon them is uh, is not very uh, is not fair, and it's not possible for them. And this is particularly true for large multifamily ventures. Uh, Joel, if you could move to the next slide, please. So, how did uh, the new home price prices behave during the pandemic? And again. The answer remains the same. The answer is very similar to the existing home prices. New home prices have been resilient as demand remains strong. The number of completed and unabsorbed homes declined this year, pushing up prices. And uh, prices have trended up in most of the metro areas, other than in Edmonton, Calgary, and Virginia. And uh, we do see that house prices have slowed in Montreal a bit but they're still growing at a very decent pace. 
Uh, Joel, could you move to the next slide, please? And now moving on to the other segment of the housing market, that's the apartment market, particularly the rental market. Uh, so the rental market is not a huge portion of the housing market, uh, especially in the sparsely populated provinces, but it's definitely a big deal for Toronto, Vancouver, and to some extent in Montreal. And uh, the vacancy rate data of apartment structures with more than six units in this chart here is from 2019, and it clearly shows the stark differences between the major markets. Toronto and Vancouver have one of the lowest uh, vacancy rates, and they have a very tight rental market with uh, vacancy rates close to one, one and a half percent. In contrast, the Prairie metro areas like Edmonton, Virginia, have a very loose rental market, and the apartment owners are struggling to find people to rent their homes. And this exerts fresh downward pressure not only on the rents, but it also exerts a downward pressure on the commercial real estate prices, as well as on the condo apartment prices. Uh, Joel, if you could move to the next slide, please. So here in this chart, you can see that uh, high vacancy rates had uh, a lot of impact on the condo apartment prices in Edmonton or in Calgary uh, because of the high vacancy rates. And it, it, one of the points you notice in this chart here is that we are seeing a flattening in the trend for Toronto. And it's not surprising that Toronto is seeing uh, a stalling plus apartment prices, mainly because uh, immigration has been curtailed this year uh, because of the pandemic. And immigrants are the ones who usually rent for the first few years, and then they go on to buy houses as they settle down in the country. Uh, now moving on to the next slide. Uh, so, so far, what we have seen is Canada's house prices are rising with some metros following the trend and some not. Now let's see how these metro areas stand in terms of valuation. Are they overvalued or are they undervalued? This chart here shows the deviation uh, of the house price from its trend house price value. Now what is trend house price value? These are based on long run macroeconomic factors such as disposable income, and population, and they're independent of the short-term business cycles like uh, unemployment rate. So, and it shouldn't be a surprise for anyone to see that Toronto and Vancouver are among the most overvalued homes, while Saskatoon in the prairies are among the most undervalued metros. Do I like to move to the next slide? So you have already seen the slide when uh, Brendan was talking about it. And uh, we all know that uh, most of us had expected the prices would fall, but uh, Canadian home mar housing market came back much stronger than most of us had imagined. But we do expect that the market would lose some of its momentum this fall. And house prices in Canada will experience a peak to drop decline of 7% by next year. And there are several reasons for it, and I'm sure Brent already talked about some of it, but let me just reiterate those points. And the first reason being the labor market is already losing pace, and it is hard to imagine a world where you have high unemployment rate and robust price growth. Second reason being Canada's House, uh, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation has estimated that 14% of the mortgage uh, were already in deferral by August, preventing some of the deleveraging driven uh, sell off. So once the, the mortgage deferrals expire in October, a bulk of those deferrals would surely come back as they were prevent, taking preventive actions just to make sure that they don't lose their homes. But we do expect the delinquency rates to rise by the end of the last quarter, putting more foreclosed properties in the market. And third, uh, the pent up demand mostly seems to be exhausted, so we do expect sales to slow. 
So we are expect that in early 2021, the housing market will no longer be able to escape the poor market conditions uh, and prices that retreat. Fortunately, these price declines will be brief and house prices will appreciate along with robust job growth in 2022. However, the risks are related to the downsides. The development of the highly effective coronavirus therapy or the vaccine remains the widest um, part, I would say, in the forecast. If the vaccine is delayed, so is the recovery and everything follows. I'll join you if you go to the next slide, please. And um, as we have already seen that there's a lot of regional differences between the house prices. Can the Toronto, Toronto area, the Vancouver area being at one of the highest um, valued market and the prairies being uh, the lowest. But going forward, uh, the current labor market conditions are how the labor market conditions would be in future would determine how much the prices would fall. And in the short, we can see that uh, Ontario, uh, the impact of the pandemic was much larger. They are almost about five and a half percent. The employment rate is still five and a half percent higher than what it used to be before the pandemic. And on the other side, the, the Atlantic provinces, the impact of the provinces was much lower. So we uh, we're expecting a much smaller impact uh, in those areas. With Keeping that in mind, let's look at how the regional forecasts look at. Um, Joel, if you could move to the next slide, please. So we do, experience, uh, do expect that the prairie provinces, for example, Calgary and Edmonton, would be, would be having the most sizable peak to drop decline, mainly because of its exposure to energy market and because of the current weak housing market. Uh, on the other end, we have Ottawa, which has extremely tight uh, housing market. The demand and supply conditions are extremely tight, so we do expect that prices would not decline that much. On the other hand, we do expect that Toronto will have a higher decline uh, compared to Canada on a whole. Uh, one of the reasons being uh, that the immigration would uh, is, has been curtailed and slower immigration would have a lot of impact, especially on the condo apartment prices. Uh, Joel, if you can move to the next slide. And uh, the asymmetry in the housing market is not limited just to the metro level. Even when we look at uh, lower levels, and this is one of the charts from the subdivision level. And uh, what we see is that even within the Toronto metro area, we see a lot of variation in the house prices. Uh, we also have house price forecasts, as Joel and uh, Joanne and Brendan already mentioned. Uh, we have house price, price forecasts at the FSA level. And these are, are our latest addition to the RPS Moody's house price forecast. With that, I will like to pass on the ball to Brian from RPS for a detailed discussion on the house price index. Thank you. Thanks, Babalasha. Um, I'm going to take a step back, return back to some historical, and drill a bit deeper into RPS's house price index. Over the next few slides, I'll share some of the highlights that we've been tracking um, as we continue to track house prices. So let's start with the national and provincial view. If you look on the graph on the upper right hand side, you'll see the national year over year growth for the aggregate house prices, excuse me. Despite the dynamic shift due to COVID-19 and social distancing, nationally we still see a growth rate remaining relatively steady since about April at over 7%. We all know real estate is local and at the provincial or regional charts below, you can see immediately it tells a different story. Provinces with the most populous cities, such as BC, Ontario, and Quebec, have consistently shown positive momentum and growth. Firstly, regions um, that I believe other economists have mentioned earlier uh, or previously that rely heavily on the oil industry, like Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Newfoundland, have been relatively flat and no real year-over-year -year growth to speak of. 
equally no major losses as well over the past several years. Uh, Joel, do you mind flipping to the next slide? The next two slides, I will continue to drill down into house prices across various dimensions even further. Some of the useful insights and in areas that don't get much coverage are within smaller regions, cities, and property types. If you can give me a few moments, I'll walk you guys through this graph. I know it's a, maybe a first time trying to see something like this. This chart shows year-over-year -year growth of a city or towns relative to the provincial average. And it also breaks it down by various property styles. So if I take the first row where you see Toronto, the dark blue bar is Toronto's year-over-year -year growth for single-family detached. You'll see a, a slight vertical black bar, which represents Ontario's or their provincial's year-over-year -year growth. Continuing to the right, you'll see a three-year trend for Toronto. And then if you look at those same repetitive graphs, but now you're looking at the results for condo. So overall, Toronto's demonstrated a consistent positive trend over the last three years, but recognize that the growth in single-family detached has exceeded Ontario's overall growth in that same property style. Conversely, for condos, Toronto does fall behind Ontario's overall year-over-year -year growth. If you want to take a different, different city as an example, if you look at Edmonton and you go about five rows down, uh, the metrics are quite different. And you'll see that they're experiencing a slight year-over-year -year growth, but it is more impressive when you compare it to the relative performance of Alberta as a whole. While Edmonton's positive metrics, they do not extend to condos as it actually underperformed compared to the entire region. Overall, it just emphasizes the importance of localization and the various property styles. Um, that can influence your uh, reporting and decision making. Can we jump to the next slide? This chart admittedly has a lot of data, so give me a moment to explain how it, what it shows. If I could use the green chart on the left, the top row is the Greater Vancouver area. Below it, in the table below, you'll see that the first row is Vancouver proper, and then it continues to the other regions around Vancouver, Langley, Surrey, Delta, and so forth. If you continue to the right, you'll see the year-over-year -year growth for a single-family detached, and as well, the last column is the condo. So let me highlight, highlight a few insights from this slide. The commentary right now in the news and broadly in the industry is that condo owners have been moving out of the core and into the outskirts to purchase a home. The data definitely supports this notion as we see condos year-over-year -year metrics slow for the most part in the core. Comparatively, we see a large year-over-year -year growth in single-family detached and neighborhoods outside of the core. Some are at a record or near record high, which may not appear as obvious. For example, in the blue chart in the middle, Whitby is experiencing a record high at 9.44%. This is especially evident in areas outside of Montreal with most of the communities outpacing single-family deeds single family detached prices growth within the core. Can we jump to the next slide, Joel? With this final slide, I'll try to bring all the previous slides together. As we continue to focus on the three major urban areas, Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, we can overlay and visualize the results from the previous slides. In the graph below, we show the trends for a few neighborhoods broken down by single family detached, condo, and aggregate. As you can see, the trends are very different relative to each other. In Surrey, for example, we've seen a steady appreciation for all property types. Mississauga had noted a surge in condo prices earlier this year, but appreciation is now returning at a level consistent with single family detached. Finally, in Mirabel, single-family detached values have been driving the aggregate price appreciation, but the condo market has been showing signs of slowing. As you can see, RPS's HPI data is broad, deep, and detailed. It can be really used to drive powerful insights and into the market, and in turn, into your portfolio and businesses. Together now with the submetro forecasts, users can have the unparalleled level of insight into the past and the future of house prices. Thanks for your time, and I'll hand it back to Joel. Cheers. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to a uh, huge thank you to the three panelists for sharing your insights and your knowledge with us.
uh, and to the audience for participating today. Just quickly before we move on to one more thing on the in terms of this uh, drop off of values, given that we seem to be in a spring season in the middle of the summer, how soon is that likely to start showing up in the marketplace, either Brendan or uh, Abalasha? Did you say, uh, my sorry. Oh, oh, sorry, I, I missed that one. What was the question? Uh, about how soon are we going to start seeing some of the uh, potential decrease in values in the marketplace? The we would expect to see decrease when when the selling season starts to slow down into the winter time, um, which also corresponds to when fiscal stimulus and monetary uh, fiscal stimulus will start to run out, and consumers will start to anticipate that you know in the coming months ahead they won't have uh, that support anymore. So we're expecting that. The turning of the housing market will, will come towards you know the end of this year. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I know that a number of questions uh, did get submitted through the chat process, and we've been trying to answer those questions as we've been going along. Certainly, if there's any more questions, if you want to reach out to connect with either RPS or Moody's analytics team, we'll uh, certainly uh, make sure that that happens. Um, just again, quickly, we're recording this presentation and uh, we are at the end of this asking for you to complete a really quick survey. Uh, but we can talk about the webinar, things that we can improve upon. And again, we're here to help you. Uh, if you do have questions or comments or things that we could do for you, uh, please just reach out to the RPS or Moody's team. Uh, lastly, let me say again, we hope you and your families, your colleagues stay safe and that the second wave is actually very short term and that we start dealing with it uh, quickly. So thank you very much for your time today and uh, we'll talk to you later.